Welcome to the Human Rights Cafe. My name is Jacob Sule. When people's rights are tampered with or denied, it means that my rights and yours have been undermined. Hence, we must educate people about their rights. The Human Rights Cafe is a collaborative virtual conversation of a right to live initiative to equip new generation of leaders to know, promote, and protect citizens' rights and dignity of all persons. The conversation seeks to promote human rights, justice, peace, and strong institutions as provided for by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Our goal is to build a nation where peace and justice shall reign and respect for citizens' rights. If you'd like to know more about the Human Rights Cafe, please join our conversation on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter via at H Rights Cafe. Once again, Jacob Sully. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good day, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening from wherever you're joining this conversation from. Welcome to today's conversation. This is the Human Rights Cafe chat streaming live from Washington, D.C. in the United States. My name is Jacob Sully. Thank you. Um, today's chat is being hosted by my friend, and um, her name is Joanna. Yes, Joanna. I think we're kind of having some internet connection over there. Um, Joanna Titus is a lawyer by training. It's a pleasure to co-host this chat with you today from um, Washington, D.C. Our guest today on the show is um, Professor Robert Goldman. Professor Robert Goldman is a professor of law and Louis C. James Scholar at the American University Washington College of Law. He is a faculty director of the War Crimes Research Office and a co-director of the Washington College of Law Center Rights and humanitarian law. Professor Goodman teaches and practices and writes in the areas of international humanitarian law, human rights, terrorism, and international humanitarian law. In 1993, Professor Goodman chaired the Commission of International Jurists on the Administration of Justice in Peru. He helped from 1994 to 1996 to develop the normative framework for internally displaced persons and was a principal author of the guiding principle on, for, on internal displacement. He was a member of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights from 1995 to 2004 and was the body's president from 1999 to 2000. In 2008, Professor Goldman was elected as a member and commissioner of the Executive Committee on International Commission of Jurists, ICJ, and since, 2020, since 2014 and as its vice president. However, in 2018, Professor Goldman was elected as, as a president of the ICJ. Prior to his election to the Inter-American Commission, he was a member of the Policy Committee on Human Rights Watch and Advisory Boards of American Watch, Helsinki Watch, and the, um, and the East Watch. Professor Goldman is currently a member of the Diplomatic Receptions, Rooms, Fine Art, and Committee in State Department. So welcome to the show, Professor Goldman. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Thank you um, sir. Um, today we're looking at a very important issue, which is on the conduct of hostilities during armed conflict. And as you are um, a very um, renowned and very known professor when it comes to the issues of IHL and all of that, um, for the purpose of those who are watching from all social media platforms, could you please provide a quick overview of the conduct of hostilities during armed conflicts? Yes, Professor. Uh, yes, I'm glad to do it. Uh, uh, th there are two kinds of armed conflicts, uh, essentially international 
such as the one that we're seeing today uh, uh, it, it, involving Russia and uh, Ukraine and non-international, uh, such as uh, what we saw in Colombia for 50 years, where one or more non-state actors uh, are organized, armed, and they are fighting a government. Although there's a lot more law, treaty-based law, governing international armed conflicts, uh, it is pretty clear from international uh, jurisprudence that uh, has arisen since the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, that any kind of method or means of warfare that would be prohibited in an international armed conflict would be similarly prohibited in, in a non-international armed conflict. The foremost rule governing the conduct of hostilities uh, is the uh, principle of distinction and civilian immunity. And simply put, it means that uh, uh, combatants must at all times always distinguish uh, between uh, combatants and civilians and uh, uh, military objectives and civilian uh, objects and only intentionally direct their attacks uh, against combatants and other lawful military objectives. That is the norm. Uh, so that is really the basic uh, rule. Uh, in order to implement this, uh, civilians uh, enjoy the highest immunity under the law of armed conflict, which is that they can only be directly or intentionally attacked if they directly participate in hostilities, which is a complex issue, but essentially uh, is assuming the role of a combatant. Uh, and that uh, so they can never be directly attacked. Uh, IHL, uh, in order to implement this, this level of protection, uh, uh, prohibits what are known as indiscriminate attacks. And, and that is if a military objective is located, for instance, in a densely populated civilian area with a lot of civilian objects, such as hospitals, homes, libraries, apartment houses, uh, then uh, uh, you cannot uh, launch an attack uh, if the foreseeable collateral damage is going to be excessive against the military advantage that uh, you think you will get from the destruction of the target. And it also protects you from the use of a weapon, which could be very discriminate in the context of an open battlefield where combatants face one another, uh, but uh, uh, in the context of, of urban warfare, uh, that uh, particular weapon could not be directed with any kind of uh, uh, basis that you could say that it's going to hit the military objective. And this is an example of cluster bombs, which, for instance, the Russians have employed extensively uh, in Syria, and, uh, uh, and, and there's certainly, there's been, from what I have read, uh, widespread use of these weapons that are indiscriminate and hence unlawful uh, in the context of attacks uh, on cities. Right, um, thank you very much, Professor, for providing that um, perspectives for um, those who are watching. Yes, Joanna, do you wanna take the next question? I guess we're having some kind of um, internet connection from Nigeria. So I'm just going to take the next question. Professor, you laid um, a very good background as regards um, the conduct for hostilities. And then I, I could recall that during um, your um, response, you also talked about some rules and all of that that are, are applicable. Now that we all understand that IHL seeks to regulate the conduct of hostilities during 
conflicts. And for those who are watching, who are wondering what are these rules and who made these rules and what are the applicable rules, can you tell us briefly what are the specific rules that governs the conduct of hostilities during an armed conflict? Yes, Professor? Well, IHL is actually, and another term for IHL is the law of war or the law of armed conflict. And it is the oldest branch of public international law that, that, that antedates the formation of the modern nation state in 1648 by at least a thousand years. If you look at most uh, uh, holy books uh, in the major religions of the world, whether it's the Old Testament, the Koran, the Book of Manu, or you look at Sun Tzu's The Art of War, you will find the equivalent uh, of instructions on the conduct uh, of, of hostilities. And over time, uh, these uh, practices and so forth ripened into customary law that is binding on states uh, in the conduct of warfare. Uh, you can see them in terms of rules of engagement uh, that historically have been issued uh, over time. So it doesn't really matter that uh, whether you're talking about uh, the East or West or North or South, that these are not, for instance, a Western European construct. There is no question uh, that the principal uh, Western European military powers and so forth, uh, which were at war you know, in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, uh, contributed a lot to uh, the, the practice. Uh, uh, but as I indicated, it, 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 these certain kinds of prohibitions uh, are, are, are found in, in traditions uh, that go back in time. It's important, let me just say, to distinguish between the two branches of international dealing with the conduct of, uh, dealing with IHL. And the first is the actual law of war. That is the law that regulates places, restraints, and prohibitions on the conduct of hostilities. And that has uh, uh, been referred to as uh, uh, the use in bellow. Uh, and it's also been called Hague law because it had its first codification uh, in the late 1890s and early 1900s. Far more recent uh, is what we call Geneva Law. And this came about in, in the mid-1860s with the formation of the All-Swiss International Committee of the Red Cross. And the focus of Geneva Law that is reflected in the or 1949 Geneva Conventions is to protect so-called victims of armed conflicts. It really doesn't deal with the conduct of hostilities. It deals with, for instance, persons who may be in the hands of or under the control uh, of the enemy. So civilians, and civilians in particular in occupied territory, prisoners of war who are in the hands of the adversary, uh, the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked, and so forth, who will be in the hands of the adversary. Uh, these two branches of law were merged uh, in 1977 in the two additional protocols. But the conduct of hostilities, which is the actual law of war, as I said, goes back <laughs> thousands since mankind basically is organized and so forth, and religions came into being. We see these reflected uh, in those holy books and so forth. In many of the kinds of prohibitions, uh, the treat the adversary who has surrendered, the prisoners of war, uh, prohibition on the use of poison, uh, these have worked their way uh, into modern treaty law. Uh, so we're talking about centuries and centuries of warfare where military people have come to realize that if a certain method or mean of war, means of warfare 
were counterproductive to, for instance, achieving uh, the political objectives for which they went to war, they would be prohibited. And this is why torture became prohibited. It was counterproductive. It gave rise to reciprocal things. The notion of indiscriminate attacks. Uh, Sun Tzu uh, 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 admonished against uh, uh, attacking uh, religious monuments, uh, digging up uh, of ancestors. Uh, these aren't things that, that contribute to the military effort. And they enrage the enemy. They'll fight even harder uh, in retribution. And so he would prohibit these things. And that kind of wisdom, if followed, is certainly uh, uh, conducive to, to efficient fighting because you're only directing scarce resources against lawful targets of attack and not wasting them uh, by doing gratuitous damage uh, and the like, which could stiffen resistance. Right. Um, thank you, um, Professor. I have a question from one of our viewers. His name is Pietro Severo. Pietro wants to know, when it comes to the evaluation of an attack under the proportionality principle, how can it be found that the expected civilian sacrifice was excessive compared to military advantage? And he said, I understand it is not only a numerical operation, but it involves also reasoning. So what is the standard for pro um, proportionality in this kind of case? You know, I wish uh, uh, I, I wish I could say that there's a rule. Uh, the notion of collateral damage, which I've mentioned, it is very much uh, a relational concept, the concept of proportionality. And this has existed for some time in the law of war. But it requires a good faith assessment on the part of the party that is going to launch an attack uh, that reasonably foreseeable death's destruction of civilians and civilian objects will be outweighed by the military advantage that is anticipated from the destruction neutralization or capture uh, of the military objective. Uh, and it is very hard, for instance, uh, to, 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 to give a formula. Uh, in essence, what it says, at least in my view, uh, is the more important the military advantage that you can anticipate from the attack the greater the degree of collateral damage. And let me give you an example. I mean, if you knew uh, that your top military of the adversary uh, were meeting uh, in a specific restaurant uh, and uh, you know that civilians are in that restaurant, uh, the civilians don't know that they place themselves at risk. But the reality is by knocking out the sort of notion of decapitating military leadership, that is an enormous strategic advantage uh, for the attacking party. In, in most circumstances, uh, that military advantage will outweigh the number of civilians. There is no one who sits in Geneva or sits at The Hague who says it's one to one two to one, three to one. No, you have to look, one, at the information, what kind of precautions were taken uh, uh, by the attacking party, all the circumstances that ruled at the time of the attack. And that is very important because uh, after the fact, determinations can be misleading. We're dealing with it frequently fast-moving developments in armed conflict. The enemy is constantly trying to deceive, mislead. That is perfectly uh, lawful to do that. And uh, uh, sometimes the advantage uh, is not going to be as great, or it may be greater. Sometimes the collateral damage is going to be less or more. And 
this is really, uh, if in dispute, uh, something that a war crimes tribunal, such as the ICTY, that is the Yugoslav Tribunal, the International Criminal Court or whatever, uh, will have to examine the particulars. It is difficult. You have to have military people who understand the realities of combat. And, and as I said, so you simply, uh, 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 you know, as I said, for this to work, that is, as it is articulated today in additional protocol one, uh, the notion of the avoidance of indiscriminate attacks and so forth, it really, it requires one, that in good faith, the attacker gets reliable target intelligence if they have a choice of weapon, to use a weapon such as a smart weapon, if the target is located in an urban area. And it also requires the party that controls the civilian population not to put its civilians at heightened risk of harm, such as using them to shield military objectives. All these things have to be taken into account uh, after the fact, if there's an allegation uh, that there's been, for instance, an indiscriminate uh, attack. The burden is still primarily, though, under the law on the attacking party to take every feasible precaution and to choose the weapon when they know by virtue of the location of the military target uh, that some collateral damage is going to ensue. They must try to avoid, and at the very least, minimize that expected damage. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, Professor, please, who are civilians and combatants, and what should be the conduct of combatants during hostilities? Well, the distinction between civilians and combatants is, is it's, it's really a negative definition. Uh, and it's found both in the Third Geneva Convention and in Additional Protocol 1. And it essentially says, for instance, in an international armed conflict, that civilians are all persons who are not members of the active duty members of the armed forces of a party to a conflict. In a non-international armed conflict, it's similar. That is, civilians are all persons who are not members uh, of uh, the government's armed forces uh, and essentially the armed forces of the organized armed opposition groups, insurgents or rebels. So that is what the definition is. Uh, and, and this can become very difficult uh, at times uh, to make these kinds of distinctions. Uh, particularly if you have combatants uh, uh, in whatever kind of armed conflict who, not, who do not distinguish themselves from the civilian population uh, why they are on active duty, such as carrying their arms openly uh, and uh, wearing a uniform or other kind of fixed uh, distinctive uh, 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 emblem. Uh, uh, but in principle, this is the distinction. The law of war encourages at all times that combatants should distinguish themselves so as not to put civilians uh, at risk. Now, the reality is that we've known, particularly with irregular or so-called guerrilla warfare, which can be practiced in international armed conflict and certainly in non-international armed conflicts, uh, uh, insurgents or the, 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 the uh, uh, weaker force uh, uh, will uh, be tempted to use civilian disguise, that is, dress themselves as civilians, have their arms concealed in order to move uh, into attack because... Mm -hmm. Since they're dressed as civilians, presumptively they're entitled to protection. They're trying to mislead uh, the adversary. And then if they take their arms out at the last moment and start shooting, killing, wounding the adversary, one, that is a war crime because it's, it's going to be called perfidy. Uh, but the, in the larger sense, it places civilians 
uh, in in risk because uh, the, the side uh, whose troops are attacked in that way uh, by civilians, uh, by members of the opposition forces that are feigning uh, uh, civilian disguise, uh, this can place civilians uh, 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 at, at, at additional risk. So you try to get this kind of distinction that is visible to the naked eye and so forth, that if they're carrying their guns, they have some kind of uniform, they are going to be lawful targets of attack. Right. Thank you, Professor, for providing that very great um, analysis between who is a civilian and a combatant. Um, I want to go to LinkedIn, where we have a question for you from one of the viewers um, this is Ademola Taiwo. He said, Professor, I would like to ask, does the law of warfare include proportionality? Well, that's, yes, it's not the same kind of proportionality that is in human rights law. The issue of the so-called rule of proportionality, in essence, I spoke about. This is the proportionality that the harm, damage to civilians uh, uh, that is foreseeable from an attack uh, cannot be disproportionate. They use the word, it's not in the conventions, but this is what is meant. It is not excessive in relation to the military advantage that is anticipated from that particular attack. That's the proportionality rule. The words that are used are collateral, ancillary, uh, excessive, interchangeable, and so forth. Right. Um, thank you. Now, Professor, I want to go to the theoretical parts of all of what we've been discussing um, for the past 25 minutes, and it will take me to the current war happening in Ukraine and with the um, government of Russia, Putin. Uh, we would see the provision of um, additional protocol one that talks about protection for civilian, Article 52, and then also Article 57, which talks about precautionary measures to be taken during attack. Professor, talk to us about um, what has been happening in Ukraine. Do you think that um, the parties to this conflict have actually been working in concern? Like, um, have they been abiding by the rules of IHL as provided for in Article 52 and Article 57? And then what precautions have been um, violated during this ongoing war in Ukraine by the Russian government? Well, you know, there are, particularly when it comes to Russia and the way they have conducted hostilities, Quite frankly, it's difficult to see what minimum rules they're abiding by. Uh, there are multiple investigations. Uh, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court uh, is uh, investigating uh, and is in, has been in Ukraine with his team, uh, uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity that have been committed, particularly in the context of urban warfare, uh, the deliberate uh, summary execution of civilians and so forth, indiscriminate attacks. I, I would say that there are one, two, three, four uh, kinds of war crimes for which I think there's very credible evidence uh, that Russia, uh, uh, Russian forces have committed, and there may well be command responsibility going up to Putin. Uh, the first deals with the crime of aggression. I mean, what was, first of all, we have to understand that Russia and Ukraine have been at war for eight years. Uh, so the, the invasion uh, uh, that took place uh, three months ago uh, was merely a new phase of ongoing military operations and so forth between uh, really what amounts to be Russian proxies in the Donbass area and so forth. Uh, this is class book. Uh, uh, this was textbook aggression, quite frankly, because uh, the justifications that uh, Putin uh, has given, you know, denazify, uh, that they're committing genocide against people in the Donbass and so forth. <laughs> Uh, and, and so uh, this is a serious war crime. And by the way, uh, it's not just Russia that would be responsible for this, uh, but Belarus, because Belarus knowingly 
permitted its territory uh, to be used for the launching of an armed attack by Russia against another sovereign uh, state. And it certainly was not done under one of the two exceptions. Russia was not attacked, was not exercising individual or collective self-defense, and it certainly was not uh, authorized by the Security Council, the military action, and so forth. So that's number one. Uh, number two is the, the crime of genocide. This is one of the most difficult things to prove uh, in international law because it requires proving an intent uh, to destroy in whole or part a group, part of a group for religious group, ethnic group, and so forth. But I think there's mounting evidence given Putin's own statements about the fact that, that uh, Ukraine does not have an identity uh, uh, and other statements that have been made uh, th that they really are seeking to, you know, uh, russify all of uh, Ukraine, at least that was the initial goal, uh, and to stamp out its statehood and so forth. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but the most likely... Uh, 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 things where I think it's going to be overwhelming are the launching of indiscriminate attacks against uh, urban areas, that is through indiscriminate weapons use. I think, it's be, I, I think the proof is going to be overwhelming. In the areas that de facto Russia controlled, towns, villages, smaller cities outside uh, of uh, Kiev, uh, they're finding mass graves. They're finding uh, people who have been summarily executed. You know, you have forensics. I've worked with them before in Latin America uh, to determine the circumstances of death. And they will establish that these people who are under the control and custody uh, of, of Russian armed forces uh, uh, were tortured and, uh, you know, summarily executed. And that is a war crime, obviously, whether it is against a prisoner of war, the wounded or sick, uh, or a civilian. In many times, war crimes uh, or committed against civilians in the civilian population can also be chargeable as crimes against humanity in the context of armed conflict. That is widespread, systematic attacks uh, directed against the civilian population. The problem, Jacob, and so forth, is going to be Russia is not like the United States and like Ukraine, a party to the statute of the International Criminal Court. Now, the Security Council, Russia would veto any attempt to the Security Council to refer the situation to the ICC, such as the Security Council did uh, in, with the situation in Sudan. Uh, some time ago. Uh, one, nevertheless, it, it does have jurisdiction by virtue of the consent that has been given by Ukraine uh, to investigate these things. Uh, but whether or not, for instance, uh, uh, the International Criminal Court could ever get jurisdiction over Russian soldiers, over Russian generals, over Putin, uh, you know, this has not happened uh, uh, often. It, I, I, you know, in the case of a sitting head of state, Milosevic was sent after he lost power, the new regime sent him. Uh, Charles Taylor, the same thing eventually ended up uh, and the like. Uh, but it doesn't look like Vladimir Putin's going anywhere very quickly. Uh, and so uh, whether or not the court ever gets jurisdiction, uh, it remains to be seen. There is talk about the possibility that acting through the General Assembly, perhaps an ad hoc court, uh, could be created to deal with the most serious crimes and criminals and so forth in the context of Ukraine. Uh, we'll have to see. Now, universal jurisdiction is certainly a possibility when it comes uh, to individual Russian soldiers. Uh, we've seen this, uh, that Germany recently uh, tried, sentenced, and convicted 
uh, members of Syrian armed forces uh, for acts of torture and so forth committed in the context of that uh, 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 ongoing armed conflict through the exercise of universal jurisdiction. But even states in those circumstances, they would not have jurisdiction to try a sitting head of government, state, uh, a defense minister, uh, or a other like foreign minister and so forth. So it, there are limitations, but I have never seen proof in an armed conflict uh, that has been gathered so quickly in other states are also cooperating in the gathering of evidence and so forth uh, to uh, verify uh, uh, the commission of, of war crimes in Ukraine. I think there'll be an overwhelmingly strong dossier. And these are oh. imprescriptible crimes. There's no statute of limitations on them. Uh, so we may very well down the line uh, see prosecutions either perhaps the international, perhaps at the national level. All right, Prof. So can we really say that IHL has truly been effective in regulating armed conflict? Look, it's the, the, the issue. The issue is a difficult one. Look, if governments want to disobey the law, I don't care if it's domestic law by staging a coup d'etat like the military uh, in a country or whatever, uh, you know, a constitution will not restrain frequently a lawbreaker. Uh, but there may be penalties to pay down the road. Uh, the Russian government has become a pariah internationally. Because people are seeing, not since the Yugoslav uh, 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 conflict, and, and we haven't seen, fortunately, anything as bad as the Srebrenica massacre that took place of in excess of 4,000, I believe, uh, young and, 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 uh, and, and other males who were summarily taken out and, and, and uh, murdered uh, uh, there. Uh, we haven't seen anything uh, alike in Europe uh, as ghastly uh, as this. And we're all seeing this in, in, in real time. And, and, uh, but if Putin does not care, and let me say something, you know, Putin certainly could have been encouraged to act in this way because other than suffering certain consequences that were minimal uh, in connection with the way he destroyed uh, <laughs> the capital of Chechnya. He leveled it. He created a Carthage. He leveled utterly indiscriminate attacks uh, against there. Then he goes when Assad invited him uh, to assist in putting down rebellion and so forth in Syria. Uh, he leveled, the Air Force leveled Aleppo, their allegations of the use of chemical weapons, the consistent use uh, uh, of, of, of uh, 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 indiscriminate weapons, again, like cluster munitions. What price did he pay? Effectively none. You know, he grabbed pieces of Georgia. What price did he pay? When he went in eight years ago, uh, into uh, Ukraine, and he grabbed and now occupies Crimea and part of the Donbass. He really did not pay any price. Fortunately, it's better late than never. He is paying a price, which quite obviously, I do not think that he contemplated as he thought he was going to be able to waltz in and seize Kiev in a matter of days and install a puppet government and so forth. Hasn't quite worked out that way. But the thing is, if you have a leader like Putin, uh, who only knows force and brutal force, and uh, that the ends justify the means, he it will not be constrained uh, by the laws of war. 
And therefore, the only thing that one can do is to see international condemnation, to see the kind of isolation economically, politically, uh, diplomatically uh, that Russia uh, will uh, 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 suffer as a consequence. And hopefully down the road, uh, there will be individual accountability for the atrocities and really very gross violations that have occurred of IHL. All right, Prof, thank you so much for that. Yep. Okay, Prof, we, we have a question from Gabriel Otsi, and it's, he says, which kind of importance do you think that the European Human Rights Courts will play in the current situation in Ukraine, specifically by assessing IHO violations? Well, I'll tell you, I'm very skeptical. I'm not a big fan of the European Court's use of IHL, as uh, I think you're, you're uh, the writer of the question probably knows. Uh, the Europeans, unlike the inter-American system, have had a very, very uh, mixed uh, record in how they deal with human rights violations that arise in the context of armed conflict. And why I'm not very encouraged is that in uh, uh, the uh, uh, interstate complaint that Georgia uh, lodged uh, against Russia uh, that involved deaths and so forth and that, that, uh, uh, from the Russian invasion and the like, uh, the court made clear uh, that they would not deal with IHL, which what amounted to the active hostilities phase, uh, but only when there was control over persons or territory. It, it, to me, that is very far. That is very, very. Uh, uh, that, that that's to me, it's not justifiable, uh, because essentially what they're saying is that they're active hostilities. Uh, you could uh, go in and I could give instructions and say, look, I want you, you go through this village, kill every woman, man, goat, you name it, anything that walks on, you know, kill them all, destroy their homes. Uh, and the court is effectively saying, don't come to us with violations of the right to life, uh, destruction of private property and so forth that is protected uh, from destruction under IHL. But we will deal with the case that if they get control and custody of the person and they torture and maybe then they execute them, yes, we'll deal with that. It is to ignore the realities of armed conflict uh, because uh, I can sign your death warrant by dropping bombs indiscriminately from 30,000 feet as well as I could if I have you under my control and custody. So quite frankly, uh, I am not at all encouraged that in the interstate complaint, which apparently uh, could be amended, and there are going to be other complaints uh, that have been filed before the European court, uh, that uh, uh, they're going to deal with IHL uh, as uh, they should. Now, maybe these judges will be so outraged and the findings will be so clear uh, from the kinds of attacks uh, on the cities uh, that they'll change their view and that they will find violations of the right to life arising out of Russia's indiscriminate bombardment and ensuing deaths of civilians in these attacks. But uh, I would not bet the farm. All right, Prof. Thank you so much, Prof, for that intelligence answer. Yeah. Prof, please, we have um, the last question from Ademola Taiwu, and it would like to read because our time is almost up. He says, I would like to ask the professor, in the light of your reading, requesting the international courts to prosecute Putin for war crimes, do you think he can be successfully prosecuted for war crimes? If yes, on what grounds? If no, why? Well, Thank yeah, you. I, I, as I said, you have to have your hands on them. And, and he, you know, I don't know. It's a very opaque regime, uh, more opaque, uh, uh, ironically, than during the Soviet Union, the control that Putin seems to have. 
and and uh, uh, it, it, the he would have to be sent to the ICC. As I said, I think there's a strong case uh, 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 if you know they somehow consented to jurisdiction, he was sent there, and so forth. Uh, uh, there are complications because of the addition in the rules surrounding uh, the notion of aggression. Uh, his own words, I think, condemn him. Both his words, he is calling the shots. I saw an interview with him where he's talking to his generals, and he says, I am giving you the order to do this. You know, cease doing that and do this, and so forth. I think there's no doubt that the command responsibility, which we've seen since Nuremberg, but very well uh, attach, but as I said, I, I really do not see, uh, uh, unless something very foreseen, the war goes very badly, uh, he is removed from power uh, somehow, uh, uh, but look, stranger things have happened. No one ever thought Milosevic uh, would end up uh, before the International Criminal Court or Charles Taylor. Uh, there are others who've been before. I've seen many, many things happen, you know, in Argentina where the principal members of the military junta were tried, convicted, served jail time. Uh, it's happened in other places. So I won't say never, uh, but but uh, it, this is going to take time if it's going to happen at all. All right. Thank you very much, um, Professor Goldman. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've been speaking to Professor K. Goldman. Professor has been talking to us about the conduct of hostilities during armed conflict. And we have now want to thank all our viewers who have joined and for the comments. And we're sorry we will not be able to take for that comment because we're out of time. I'd like to thank you very sincerely, Professor Goldman, for joining this chat today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we look forward to um, having you all and we'll be looking forward to a greater conversation. Yes, Professor, before we go, do you have a final thoughts for those who have joined the chat today? No, no, I'm, I'm glad there's interest in this. It's important, you know, if one can't be interested and want to do something about a situation like we're seeing, uh, it's hard to know what one could get uh, aggravated about. Uh, this kind of thing should not stand. Right. anywhere, whether it's done by Russia, you know, or another power or whatever. It, 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 it is outrageous. It's shocking to the sense of decency of all people. So, you know, uh, everyone has to work hard. Uh, it's like anything, just because uh, we're seeing the law on one side uh, it not being obeyed uh, does not mean that IHL, if it is respected, cannot not only sort of humanize the conflict, uh, right. but uh, spare spare the innocence. And that's what we need to see. Right. Thank you very much um, to Professor Goldman and to Joanna, who has joined us from Abuja in Nigeria. Thank you so much for coming on the show. i see you again next week. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Welcome to the Human Rights Cafe. My name is Jacob Sule. When people's rights are tampered with or denied, it means that my rights and yours have been undermined. Hence, we must educate people about their rights. The Human Rights Cafe is a collaborative virtual conversation of a rich live initiative to equip new generation of leaders to know, promote, and protect citizens' rights and dignity of all persons. The conversation seeks to promote human rights, justice, peace, and strong institutions as provided for by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Our goal is to build a nation where peace and justice shall reign and respect for citizens' rights. If you'd like to know more about the Human Rights Cafe, please join our conversation on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter via at H. Wright Cafe. Once again, Jacob Sully, thank you.